and uh, today. Sandy, I apologize. Could you uh, please uh, start over? I accidentally had you muted. Oh, that, that's great. Thanks, Ben. All right, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, thank you for joining our, our webcast today. Uh, my name is Sandy Drew. I'm a client technical specialist for IBM's X-Series, X86 uh, Flex, and Voice Center-based uh, portfolio. Uh, today we're going to talk about our new X6 portfolio, which uh, we announced back in February to coincide with Intel's new E7 Ivy Bridge V2 processor um, product portfolio. With that being said, uh, we announced three different platforms uh, to leverage this new uh, E7 uh, technology. Uh, as you can see, it's a scalable 8-way 3950X6 uh, rack-based solution, and then our our the central piece of our portfolio is our our four-way 3850X6 scalable solution. And then in addition to that, we announced uh, uh, products in the Flex family as well, the 280, 480, and 880 scalable solution for, um, for the uh, Flex portfolio. <clears throat> Back in 2001, uh, IBM introduced its first-generation scalable 16-way uh, solution into the marketplace. This was a mainframe-inspired product that took advantage of Intel's MP or multiprocessor base, which would be the previous, I guess, the predecessors to Intel's current E7 product portfolio. Since then, IBM has, you know, we've, we've topped the patent list, uh, you know, 19 years in a row. Uh, but in addition to that, we are a market leader in the four socket on up. And since 2001, we've introduced multiple generations of what we call our EXA architecture, our EX architecture. And we've, you know, taken the market by storm, you know, leading in market share in four way and on up, um, you know, achieving number one ben benchmarks across, you know, TPMC, um, memory leadership, scalability leadership, and now we're up to our sixth generation here in uh, 2014. What is X6 and what type of a solution workload would you position an E7 X6 based uh, product uh, into uh, your infrastructure? Uh, key workloads that you might find um, ideal for this particular product, product set would be an ERP analytics database and virtualization. You know, key what we see with a lot of our clients are you know primarily in virtualization, scale up large memory footprints, benefiting in that area. Um, maybe DB2 or SAP HANA, where you have in database memory um, or you know uh, database in memory. Excuse me. Uh, so you, this is ideal for enterprise class workloads. This isn't going to be something that you may throw in and have a one-off web server. This is going to be designed for that 99.99 percent .99 uptime which Intel likes to, to, to really push with regards to the E7 uh, uh, pro, uh, processor and the RAS features that come along with that. That being said, we'll, I'll talk a little bit about uh, an overview of each one of the individual products themselves, and then we'll dive deeper into the technical merits of each one. So to start, start off, we have our 36, or 3850X6, which is our four-socket, uh, you know, 4U based, scalable, uh, rack-based uh, product. Uh, it supports up to a total of six terabytes of memory, and that taking can take advantage up to 60 cores of uh, leveraging Intel's E7 processors. Now, those are 15 core processors each. That's 60 physical cores, or if you take into account symmetrical multi-threading, that can be 120 logical cores. This can scale to 12 terabytes. This is fully upgradable in the field. Uh, via an IBM service technician, and we'll talk a little bit about what, what that entails in terms of doing that upgrade in the field. This is the eight-way solution. This can be purchased as a 3950X6, uh, configured uh, how you choose to do so directly at purchasing, or as I previously stated, you could purchase a 3850 four-way solution and scale this. This will go up to eight sockets for an 8U footprint in the rack, supports a total of 12 terabytes of memory, 120 cores of, of physical processing power, 240 if you take into account SMT. And then last but not least, in the X6 product portfolio here, we have the Flex 2 socket scalable to 8 socket solution. This is, again, taking advantage of the E7 processor. Uh, this, uh, again, starts off with a two-socket 48 dim solution with four MES parts and scales all the way up to an eight-way where you can have up to 16 MES parts uh, per solution. 
And so that being said, we'll jump right into a little bit about the architecture behind the E7 processor. <clears throat> this is uh, Intel's highest reliable and scalable processor in the marketplace to date. This is designed to really compete in the mainframe space uh, with that maximum uptime. Uh, it comes in three different variations. Uh, for the top of the line uh, performance, you have your 8800 series, which uh, denotes uh, an eight uh, scalable up to eight uh, processors. You have the 4800 series processor, which is scalable up to four, and then your 2800 series processor. Why that's important has to do with, uh, you know, if today you want to purchase a four-way solution and you know that you're going to grow to an eight-way solution, you're probably going to want to purchase the 8800 series processors. That way you do not have to do any field upgrades to processors to do that. Uh, taking a step down, we have the E5 family of processors. This is going to be your high volume 1U, 2U uh, based uh, servers, which you, you, you typically find in, uh, you know, again, that high volume space. Uh, the key differences between the E7 and E5 come in the RAS features and functions, and I'll talk a little bit about those later. Of course, uh, and, and bringing in the bottom of Intel's uh, Xeon family is the E3 uh, single socket based uh, solution. We do have a couple of those in our product portfolio. So with the E7 uh, series uh, V2 processors, Intel's uh, introduced up to 15 cores. Uh, this supports up to eight channels of DDR memory, uh, two memory controllers per processor. Uh, you take a jump in your uh, your last level cache, or your LLC, uh, 237.5 per uh, per processor. And then, of course, your PI links now jump up to 8 giga transfers per second. Now, what's interesting to note about this is the 32 lanes of PTI Express Gen 3. That's 1 gigabit or giga transfers per second or gigabits per second on the uh, PTI Express lanes. The total of 32 giga transfers or 32 gigabytes per second uh, to each individual, individual processor for a total of 128 uh, in a physical four way server. <coughs> There are also four lanes of PCI Express 2.0 uh, per processor as well. So um, as I previously mentioned, you get eight DDR channels per socket. Uh, so a significant uh, performance uh, and throughput in the memory subsystem here. Supports a total of 24 DIMMs. So that's three DIMMs per channel um, per processor. And then, of course, um, memory controller speeds on, or the memory speeds here are up to 1600 megahertz. So while your E5-based processors can now go up to 1866, the E7s are still going to be capped at 1600 megahertz. But they drop down from there to 1333 and 1066. So in the previous generation, you had a cap of 1066. Of the previous generation E7, now you have a cap at 1600. So one of the key differences between the you know the E5 and E7 uh, features are, or processors themselves are going to come in the RAS features, um, and there are about 20 different RAS features between the E5 and E7. So that's kind of why you would want to leverage an E7 processor in that enterprise uh, workload is those additional reliability, availability, and serviceability. And the, of note, specifically on this particular chart, is the MTA, or machine check architecture. This is a, a software-assisted recovery um, that's you know, critical in the sense that, let me give you a, a, a typical workload and example of kind of what would happen on an E5 processor. Say you have an E5 processor-based um, workload, maybe it's a VMware host. Uh, you have a multi-bit error or a DRAM chip failure um, at the hardware layer. Well. When something like that occurs, maybe it extends beyond the predictive failure in the system. You know, it, what's going to happen is your host is going to go down. With MCA recovery built into the E7 architecture, as long as the hardware vendor, in this case here IBM, the software vendor, in this case being um, VMware, you know, the OS level, and then, of course, the processor, all support MCA, then what can happen is, Hardware is detected, uh, has a failure, or determines that there's a multi-bit failure or maybe a DRAM chip failure. The OS is alerted and is aware of that specific failure. And it pins whatever VM, for example, may be sitting on top of a particular failure. That VM is the only piece that goes down. Now, it has to be implemented in that, in that manner. There has to be operating system level support. It has to be OS level support. And then there, there obviously has to be chip level support, in this case here, the E7. So 
Uh, MCA is, is a very unique feature, um, obviously, to the E7 family, and it is obviously critical in um, in workloads, for example, such as virtualization, because uh, you know when you're running 100 to 200 VMs, you don't want to have a DIM or a multi-bit failure take that entire host down. So with the V2 processor, uh, Intel extended that to I/O. The uh, PCI Express controller now sits on the processor, so you have some of those additional machine check uh, reliability features built into uh, the processor and the I/O subsystem as well. So processes that are say um, pinned to a particular I/O um, stream um, may only alert. Uh, it may only alert uh, to that one specific VM that may be may be uh, leveraging that particular uh, I/O stream. So when you look at the entire breadth of the E7 V2 product family, here are the, the differences uh, in the individual uh, processors themselves in terms of frequency. Now, unlike the previous generation, this does take a, a you know a line similar to the E5 based processors, where now you have a basic standard and advanced, and population rules do apply now on the E7 V2 uh, based family, whereas in the X5 or previous generation. That was not uh, population rules were not were not critical on memory ran at 1066. Now it is critical in the way that you uh, populate. Also, uh, keeping in mind the basic standard and advanced level processors, you know, QPI bandwidth uh, change um, with advanced being at eight gigatransfers and then stepping down to 7.2 and uh, 6.4 from there. Also, note memory frequencies change uh, with each level of processor. So, uh, some consideration needs to be taken when actually configuring your system, um, and to ensure um, proper memory performance on the uh, on the uh, subject. So, we'll jump right into the Flex X6 portfolio. Uh, the architecturally between the Flex 6 and the uh, 3850X6 portfolio, architecturally they're going to be fairly uh, identical. So, we'll just high level talk about the actual. Um, on the Flex 6, we'll just talk about the actual hardware itself. So about 18 months ago, or you know, about two years ago, IBM introduced their Flex system product portfolio. This is our fully integrated um, solution that comprises both compute, chassis networking, management, and of course storage. You know, we have a number of products in this particular family, um, you know, ranging from entry level, uh, you know, nodes all the way up through our enterprise class X6 and then power nodes. So this is a fully integrated uh, solution that can be either configured DTO in the field or can be customized and wheeled in directly from IBM to fit for your, your, your specific purpose. So with the X6 product, uh, you know, we, we introduced um, the Flex6 280 nodes uh, and 480 and uh, 880 solutions. Starting with the two socket uh, scalable uh, 280 node. It is a two-socket E7-based uh, product with up to 48 uh, low-profile DDR3 DIMMs that can run up to 1,600 megahertz, depending on population rules. Has four ports of 10 gig LOM per node, uh, four mezzanine slots per node. Uh, does have support up to two uh, 2.5-inch uh, SAS or SATA disk, and then of course we have embedded DSXI uh, keys on those as well. Uh, we do have flash, uh, or no, excuse me, um, it is scalable to eight sockets up to 192 DIMMs, and I'll talk a little bit about how that will work. Again, uh, workloads, again, these are mission critical. These are going to be enterprise class workloads, SAP, HANA, Oracle, for example, uh, virtualization, mission critical type uh, workloads. So how this will actually scale in the chassis is very unique. Uh, we have what we call a scalability card or uh, adapter that slides onto the front of the server. In a two socket, that's going to just be a dummy card that sits on the front. But when you scale to a four socket solution, you will have an actual adapter that will, uh, which will connect onto the front of this, uh, onto the front of the server. Uh, scale into a four socket is going to be similar to what you might see in a four socket 3850 rack based solution. It will consist of four E7 processors, six terabytes of memory total capacity, 96 DIMMs. Uh, up to eight mez slots, so eight uh, mezzanine cards will fit on that, and of course four 2.5 inch, and then of course scaling all the way over to your right, your eight-way X880 solution. Again, similar to what you might find in, find in the 3950, uh, leveraging eight E7 processors, 12 terabytes of memory, and then of course up to uh, 16 mezzanine cards. So I talked about the scalability connector on your left-hand side on the 280 node, it's just a dummy connector, but as you 
as you scale uh, up in the solution, you will have to replace that with a QPI connector on the front of the actual server itself. Now, are scalable in two, four, and eight, so you cannot do intermixing or you can't scale to a six socket solution. It would have to be two, four, or eight. So positioning in a flex, position, uh, flex uh, system and flex portfolio, as you can see on the left hand side, we have our entry level of our Q20 solution, which is based off the E52400 series processor. And then as you move right, uh, you can see where the 28480 and X880 um, product family falls in line with remaining nodes in the product portfolio. So jumping uh, into exactly kind of how it looks, I'm just going to give you a couple of uh, slides here. This is the 280. This is a full width uh, uh, node in the chassis. Uh, the image here doesn't really give it justice, but it is a full width uh, uh, node in the chassis itself. You have a USB 3.0 port, your KVM port on the front, or your crash part uh, port on the front, and then of course the, the SMP or TPI, uh, the dummy uh, connector on the front, and then of course your traditional light path um, and link lights on the front as well, and including your hard disk drives. Taking the cover off the top, you have your 48 DIMM slots, your two processors, uh, slots for your hard disk drives, and of course your four um, mezzanine parts on the actual back of the planer. So we'll jump right into the 3850X6 product family. Moving over from our left-hand side, or our general business on our 1U, 2U based socket solutions, our biggest seller in this space is our 3650M4 solution consisting of three different products in that family, all leveraging the E52600. So where would you want to position the X6 solution is going to be in here? You're going to want that scalability, that scalability, and the maximum performance that you can get. Uh, from this particular product family. In the middle there, we do have a product there, a 3750 M4, an AMD-based solution, um, or excuse me, it, it, it is a four-socket, 2U-based solution um, that is an extremely high-performing um, a, a product in, in that set. It's not designed for enterprise class workloads because it is a four-socket, 2U, 48M, 8 PGI Express. Really, you, designed and engineered for um, the uh, for high performance compute workloads. And I said it was AMD and I apologize, it's actually an Intel based uh, 4000 series E5 uh, processor. So if you're familiar with IBM's 3850 product family and our previous generation, our EX5 product family, um, this is going to give you a quick side by side comparison of the where uh, the X6 falls in terms of uh, you know, growth from the previous generation. You'll see up to a 10, uh, 10x uh, increase in the amount of, of storage that you can, you, you can achieve within the chassis itself. And we'll talk about some of the different storage technologies that are capable uh, in this particular product family. You'll see a 300% increase in total memory capacity. And then, of course, a 50% increase in total number of cores. So you jump from 40 cores to 60 cores in the product family. And of course, uh, with the E7 product family, we've in, they've introduced some in additional RAM features and functions over the previous generation, some of which I, I, I talked about earlier, which would be some of the NCA IO recovery functions that are built into the E7 family. And then, of course, we have an increase in the number of PCI spots and the amount of throughput uh, in the IO. Uh, and last but not least, uh, there is a new, uh, I guess, uh, way of thinking about it, uh, uh, kind of a skew from your traditional top-down serviceability uh, features in um, most uh, rack-based solutions. Uh, we've taken kind of a, a different approach here, and it's more of a modular approach to serviceability on the systems themselves, and that we introduced that technology with the 3850 product family. That being said, the front view of the 3850 itself uh, is um, this is what we have from a, from a front view perspective. So I talked about the modular um, perspective of the 3850. The 3850 is a front to back um, modular concept. So it's a departure from that top down reliability or excuse me, serviceability model where you have to pull the server out of the rack, remove the cover to uh, excess or um, service any components within the chassis itself. 
The 3850, like I said, is a chassis-based solution. So all components within the chassis itself are removable front to back. This allows for rapid removal and replacement of key components critical to the system being or critical to the system's uptime. So what we call these particular modules are called books, similar to what you might find in a library where you go in and pull a book off the shelf. So from looking at the, the actual front of the 3850 itself, on the left-hand side we have what's called our storage book. This houses the primary components for storage in the, in the unit itself from a 2.5-inch or 1.8-inch uh, storage perspective. It can support eight 2.5-inch uh, uh, spindle disks or up to 16 8-inch um, what we call our EX flash uh, solid state disks and technology. Of course, in addition uh, onto the storage book, we have our LCD panel, which can be configured in the UAFI of the system to display specific information as you specify. And then, of course, your traditional light path diagnostics, uh, USB ports, and then, of course, crash port on the front. And then moving over to the right, we have what we call our compute books. And each compute book will consist of one processor, 24 bin slots uh, per book. So when you actually explode the unit itself from the front, you get a general idea of how these actually work and how the components themselves be pulled in and out of the actual chassis. Um, on the left-hand side, as I talked about previously, you have your storage book. That storage book is uh, necessary for the system uh, to boot, whether you have storage in there or not, because it houses, again, light path diagnostics and other key critical functions on the front of the system. And then over to your right, we have the individual compute books and how they pull out. Each compute book consists of two hot swap fans. The compute books today are not hot swappable, so we do get that question quite a bit uh, as to whether or not you can actually pull a compute book out on the fly. No, that is not going to be the case here on this particular portfolio. When you take a look around the back of the unit itself, again, taking, a, a, taking into consideration the modularity here and the book concept on the right-hand side, we have a primary I.O. book. Primary I.O. book uh, will consist of two uh, hot swap uh, fans, and then, of course, our primary MES slot. These units do not, depending on the model, the MES slot is a proprietary slot designed for use with specific what we call MLOM or ML2 adapters uh, for this particular uh, server. So that being said, there are no integrated uh, Ethernet ports on the server standard. This is an option that we provide to the customers to choose at their time of configuration. Some models will come with the ML2 with a, an ML2 adapter standard. However, uh, there will be other models that will not include it. And the purpose behind this is that some uh, we found that uh, many clients in, in the industry may standardize on a specific uh, chipset. For example, they may standardize on Intel as their primary. Ethernet vendor of choice, and you know, having Broadcom on board, probably they're not going to use it. They would have to take up a PCI uh, Express slot in order to leverage an Intel adapter. So this gives you some flexibility in design, design up front. In addition to that, you do have three PCI slots on the primary I/O book, and I'll talk about how these connect into the CPU books here shortly. Again, as I mentioned earlier, with the E7 V2 processors, the PCI Express controller now fits on the processor, so that's critical in how you design and lay out components within the, the actual chassis itself in order to optimize throughput to I/O performance. Uh, on your left-hand side, we do have uh, two additional I/O books. Uh, that can be configured, uh, whether it's a full length or a half length, and I'll go into detail about what those comprise. And then at the bottom, we do have four hot swap power supplies on uh, at the, the bottom, and I'll talk about the, uh, the different power supply options and how you can configure those within the chassis. When you explode them, as you can see, each component can be pulled out front to back from the uh, back of the system itself. One thing I want to note, the primary I.O. book is standard on the server, obviously necessary to boot the server. The two I.O. books on, on your left-hand side uh, are not uh, necessary for the server to boot. You do not have to have those configured when you actually purchase the server. Uh, however, if you do want to leverage uh, additional PCI slots beyond the, the primary I.O. book, you would need to add those. And of course, because of the way that the architecture on the system, you would have to have uh, processors to import depending on how you enumerate. Uh, you would, uh, those are going to be tied directly to the I.O. books themselves. So jumping right into the, the compute book, when you pull the compute book out of the, uh, the server itself, as you can see, it will consist of one E7-based processor and then up to 24 10 slots per uh, compute book. The compute books themselves will have 
covers and with uh, you know that you can actually view uh, the actual dims themselves. Why is this important? Uh, that has to do with light path diagnostics because of the amount of memory in the store itself with the total capacity of up to 96 DIM slots with each compute book comprising of 24 DIMs. If you have a DIM failure, uh, you want to see where that DIM failure occurs. This will give you the capability of, of viewing that DIM without actually having to pull the cover off. So one of the driving factors behind the modularity concept was the ability to do upgrades. Now, in the past, when you needed to go from, say, an, an X4 to an X5 generation of uh, EXA architecture, it consisted of a full in-place upgrade or replacement of the server in order to take advantage of it. The approach here is the ability to do Today, for example, we have a storage book that consists of you know, two and a half inch disks. Uh, consists, uh, you know, or you can take advantage of 1.8 inch solid state disk. That's a storage book. In the future, we may come out with a new type of technology, a new storage technology, and that storage book may wind up getting replaced with a new storage book. In addition to that, uh, taking a look at the processor generations. This is really designed to go out to one, if not two, generations of processor upgrades. So, in two years, you need to upgrade your processor and your server simply pull out a modular compute book and replace the compute books with the new technology and you're back up and running without without having to replace the entire server. Again, reducing overall cost and overhead in terms of having to, uh, you know, capital expenses to, uh, to purchase uh, a, a complete replacement on your, um, your server. So I'll talk a little bit about the memory architecture here. Each processor consists of two memory controllers. Those go out to four what we call Jordan Creek memory buffers. So you have SMI lanes going to each one of your memory buffers. And off of those memory buffers come the eight memory channels that will be driven with each system and the gems on each compute book. Along with that, this is an E7, with the E7 architecture, there are multiple different mirroring modes, or not, excuse me, mirroring modes, memory modes that the system can be configured uh, in uh, the uh, in the UEFI uh, to uh, give you performance versus reliability. So you have independent mode, what we call performance mode, lockstep mode, which is uh, standard with the E7 V2 processors. Uh, they introduce what's called double data rate capture, um, um, and then of course you have a, or excuse me double device data capture um, or um, a, with the lockstep mode. And then, of course, we have different other modes, including mirrored mode and lens bearing mode on the actual subsystem. Two modes that I really want to talk about here because we get a lot of questions are what's called the lockstep mode, which was introduced with the uh, E7 V2I bridge processors. And again, that is a double device data capture mode. What that means is that you know, with the double device data capture, you can sustain up to or the system is able to sustain and isolate errors on up to two DRAM chips on uh, on a memory um, DIMM. So you know that gives you uh, an enhanced level of uh, reliability and system uptime uh, on uh, on the on this particular platform. In previous generations, uh, they had single device data capture that's been around since probably the mid 1990s. Uh, and so, in this particular space, SDDC was has been you know, been capable. With the E7 Ivy Bridge V2 processors, uh, they introduced the lockstep mode with double device data capture. Now, what that does is both your SMI memory buffers and memory trips will run at 1600 to give you, you know, you'll still have significant performance, but you will sacrifice some of that performance in order to sustain a multi-chip failure in the subsystem. Well. What they also introduced is the independent or performance mode, which allows the system itself to drop back to SDDC mode, or single device data capture mode. In this mode, your SMI memory buffers will run at uh, 2.6 gigatransfers per second, while the memory will run at half of that at roughly 1.3 gigahertz. So what this can result in is a significant throughput increase or bandwidth increase upwards of 50 percent um, bandwidth increase, but you do sacrifice some error correction uh, by falling back to SDDC mode. So with the X5 
six uh, product announcement, IBM introduced a new technology uh, called EX Flash Dims. Uh, EX Flash Dims uh, are, think of it as solid state disks sitting directly on the memory subsystem. It's directly connected to the processors themselves via a DIMM slot. What this allows is the lowest possible latency in the industry from a solid state perspective. We're seeing uh, latencies as low as three to five microseconds. Uh, you get linear performance scaling because they sit in a DIMM slot and they are directly connected to the memory controller on the process. You could not get any closer without putting the solid state disks on the processor themselves. And then of course, uh, significant uh, IOP performance. And then, you know, it's very efficient in, in its modeling. And then of course, we have flexibility there with uh, capacities ranging 200 to 400 gigabytes and these DIMMs. So in today's typical server solution, this uh, this technology has to go through uh, from the processor has to go through an I/O hub to a PCI controller and then out to your disk. Storage is remote from the processor; it's remote from the memory, so you get response times that tend to suffer. Over time, you don't get significant you know, efficiency out of that. It doesn't scale efficiently. It doesn't cost, it, it, the, the cost just doesn't, you know, scale efficiently in that type of a solution. So with EX slash DIMS, what we did again, is, as I mentioned previously, we introduced solid state technology that actually sits local to the processor by sitting in a DIM. It's coupled to the processor, applications and system memory. You don't have to fight with bus contention. Um, it's all eliminated because it's directly attached to the, to the memory itself. And so you eliminate a large portion of the system by having it directly attached. You get ultra low perform or low latency, extremely high performance, and then of course you get linear scaling in terms of performance uh, versus cost. So what is the EX flash dim? It is a solid state disk. It is. It will sit in a memory slot on the subsystem or on the on the memory subsystem. It will leverage a DDR3 uh, protocol at the at the actual system hardware level. It is a registered DIM, so it shows up as an R DIM. However, it is configurable as a block level device. I talked about it already about the lowest uh, latency, significant IOPS in terms of performance. Um, it does, again, as with most solid state disks today, you have smart monitoring, it does support uh, trim, and you'll have maintenance tools at the application layer that you can do uh, you know, management of the actual disks themselves or the solid state disks themselves. They are scalable from 200 to 400 gigabyte uh, capacities. And then, of course, uh, they do have a significant EVTF uh, in terms of any kind of speed failure. So how does, uh, what does the actual architecture look like on an EX slash DIM? Again, it is a standard solid state disk. It is a storage subsystem consisting of NAND flash as a flash controller. It does have firmware itself. And then, of course, the one thing to note on the left-hand side there, as opposed to using a SAS-like uh, protocol to communicate with the system, it actually is leveraging a DDR3 client protocol to communicate with the actual system itself. So as it's presented up through the hardware stack, is at the bottom you see the actual memory, uh, the memory DIMM itself. It presents itself to the UEFI, and then of course there is an OS layer driver, as well as a management uh, software package to allow you to manage uh, trim functionality as well as weight functionality. Key things to note in the 3850 uh, portfolio um, when populating these particular DIMMs, um, I want to, I do want to quickly mention that. Uh, these are supported, and I do have a slide that talks about which systems these are currently supported on. On X6, they are supported on the 3850 and 3950 today. Um, however, on the Flex system, those will not be coming. Support for that will not be coming until third or fourth quarter on the Flex systems for the X Plus disks. So, um, when populating these systems uh, with the EX Flash uh, DIMMs, that's the 3850 or the 3950, uh, the 3850 will support up to 32 of these in the system. Okay, 
Um, and that being said, they are registered DIMs or presented to the system as registered DIMs, so they cannot be intermixed with our low-reduced DIMs in capacities of 32 and 64 gig. So you need to keep that in mind when populating the system themselves. Um, when you actually take advantage of, say, the 400 gig DIMs uh, or SSDs, you can get up to a 12.8 terabyte uh, storage solution at um, in each individual node themselves. Uh, performance mode is uh, is necessary in order to leverage this on the systems themselves. Uh, and then, and as I previously mentioned, these DIMs do have device firmware and they do have drivers. They are, again, as I mentioned, block level storage. So they are not an enhanced cache to the processor. They are storage. They just happen to be storage sitting on the memory subsystem. So what's critical here is that you can take advantage of you know, enhanced technologies such as our flash scan storage accelerator to leverage this technology as an extremely low latency um, disk solution. Uh, so for example, a typical um, environment that you might want to leverage um, EX flash uh, might be uh, database you know, where you want to say put your 10 PB uh, files where they're constantly being read and written to. Um, and you need rapid access to it, that's where an EX flash DIM might come in, uh, come in handy. So what you might see from a performance perspective is you can get up to 30% lower latency than your, your traditional PCI Express flash uh, disks. Again, as I previously mentioned, you get uh, linear scaling with this. Uh, so performance and cost actually scale linear in the system uh, than what you might see with a traditional PCI Express. Uh, and then, of course, we have a couple of unique features here. Um, we have a, a feature that's called Right Now, which allows a commit uh, at the hardware layer. So think of it as kind of like right back cache. Um, the controller, this is, an, an, this is specific to the EX flash. The, uh, the actual SSD will send a message up to um, the application stack saying, uh, application's been written or data's been written to the SSD before it's actually been written and then it writes it back. Right. So it gives you that enhanced performance increase there uh, to help lower the, the latency on the uh, disk subsystem itself. Soft rating, uh, of course, at the application layer. Um, where this might actually fall in terms of access time comparison, on the far right, your traditional hard disks or your, your spindle-based disks, and as you move left, you can actually start to see where you might see performance improvements with SSDs. You know, obviously SSD and in flash technology from a traditional 1.8 inch or 2.5 inch or even possibly uh, PCI Express. Where you might see the SSDs or EX flash DIMMs uh, falling in terms of access time comparison are going to fall somewhere in between that uh, that RAM. Uh, and CPU cache. So sitting in RAM, your SSDs are going to be falling kind of in that category there. Uh, the purpose I really wanted to, to, to highlight on this slide here is if you look down at the bottom right hand corner, and this slide deck will be provided following the presentation, uh, you get a good comparison there of kind of where EX flash DIMs fall in terms of latency and in terms of uh, actual performance. Uh, as, as stated previously, it is the lowest possible latency of any solid state technology in the industry today. We are the only vendor currently in the marketplace to provide this technology. And then, of course, as you move left from the EX flash uh, DIMMs themselves, we have our EX flash SSDs, the 1.8 inch. Uh, you do have uh, increases in the latency there. Uh, probably the closest that you might find might be the PTI Express solid state technology. Uh, they do uh, have some low latency disk technology out there. However, it, as previously noted, it cannot scale linearly in the system, and it can't get as cannot achieve the kind of performance level that you can achieve with the EX flash DIMMs. So, when you're actually looking at uh, total cost per gigabyte, um, EX flash DIMMs themselves actually are very cost efficient. Um, when compared to our enterprise value and our enterprise PCI Express uh, flash adapters in the marketplace. So it's priced very competitively per gigabyte. So you, you know, when you actually start looking at dollar per IOPS, again, it is uh, priced uh, very, uh, very competitively in the marketplace there. Supported servers today, 
Uh, it is, this is supported in our 3650 uh, in four class of servers. Uh, there are rules and uh, rules uh, pertaining to how you would populate in that particular uh, server. Uh, up to eight DIMMs or EF class DIMMs are supported on that particular uh, uh, platform. And then, of course, the 3850 and 3950 uh, class of servers are supported with EF class uh, DIMMs. Uh, additional servers uh, will be uh, coming in our portfolio um, as, as we move forward. I talked a little bit about Flash Dance Storage Accelerator earlier, and what that is is in the application, uh, basically, caching accelerator um, that will allow you to cache hot data local to the server on solid state disks. This applies to any uh, direct attached storage or SAN based, NAS based storage. What this will allow you to do is to take advantage of uh, basically an easy tier type functionality that you might find, say, in a store-wide C7000 to take advantage of that ultra-low latency EX flash uh, DIM technology to cache um, look to the server itself. This is not a replacement for something along the lines of easy tier on the back end on the storage subsystem. This is specific to local workloads on your, on your individual server. As I previously uh, mentioned it does support with SAN, NAS, direct to cache storage solution, and it does support our entire uh, our entire flash portfolio. So I'll I'll talk a little bit about the the I/O books and the storage books here, just to give you a, a general overview. The storage book, as I previously mentioned, does have all of the uh, the, the 2.5 inch or 1.8 inch SSD hot swap. Uh, slots on the front it does consist of the LCD panel and the pusher crash part. But what's unique to the storage book, it does have two internal RAID adapter slots. Those RAID adapters are not failover adapters, so don't confuse that. That's, for example, if you wanted to put two different RAID adapters, say I want to have um, EX flash 1.8 inch and 1.8 inch SSD uh, EX flash pack in there, where I've got eight 1.8 inch SSDs, and I want to put a high performance. Um, uh, SSD rate controller behind that one slot goes to that back plane, and then maybe I've got a tier two or tier one level um, spindle disk in the other four 2.5 inch uh, bays. I'll put another adapter and maybe put that adapter to that back plane on for those disks. So that is unique to the storage book itself. And then, of course, you know I, I just mentioned it uh, support of the two back planes here, um, and on those back planes they are 12 gig fast. And we do have, uh, at, at announce, we did have, uh, did announce uh, several adapters that are, uh, are supported in this server in those particular slots themselves, including the 5210 RAID adapter based off of the LSI SAS 3108 chipset. And then, of course, we have the 6 gig SAS controller um, based off of the 2208 chipset and then a little cost rate adapter that does, um, that does uh, focus primarily on non-RAID SSD or JVON focus uh, performance. So on the I.O., give me one second here, <clears throat> I talked about it earlier, um, with, the, uh, with the 3850 or the X6E7 um, product, um, you take a jump up from Gen 2 to uh, Gen 3 PCI Express. Um, the PCI controller has moved from the I.O. hub on the planer now to the processor, so what that means is numer architecture or numer rules do apply. So PCI slots will be tied directly to the processors themselves. So when you're populating a system with I/O adapters, you want to take that into consideration. You probably don't want to put, <coughs> excuse me, if you have three adapters, you don't, probably don't want to put all three adapters tied to one processor themselves. You probably want to split those across multiple processors so that loads are split uh, and um, balanced across the system themselves. So as I previously mentioned, uh, you with the uh, Gen 3, uh, you get up to uh, 32 gigabytes per second per processor, so a total of 125, uh, 28 per per system on a four socket uh, basis solution. So we have three I/O book options uh, on the system. Obviously, the base is a, a standard component on all 3850, 3950 solutions. These I/O books are necessary for the systems to boot. They consist of three internal I/O or PCI Express slots plus the ML2 slot. It does have a USB slot on there as well for in, internal uh, GSXI keys or uh, you know security keys if you choose to leverage that. 
Then we also offer two options, the full-length I.O. book and the half-length I.O. book. I'll talk a little bit about those now. Starting with the base I.O. book, as previously mentioned, three PCI Gen 3 slots, two by 16, and one by 8 slots. Those are not going to be designed for higher wattage uh, by 16 cards. Those are by 16, uh, but not leveraging, say, the 300 watt uh, GPUs. Those will be, uh, you can take advantage of those in the full length I.O. book, which I'll talk about here in a moment. Um, in addition to uh, the PCI Express slots, and you do have your USB port, your INMV2 is on this particular, um, on the uh, base I.O. book, as well as the, uh, the PCH, or the plat uh, Platform Controller Hub. It does have an IMM gig, gig E port. Uh, again, that is not an Ethernet port to be used for the actual system itself in terms of operating systems that's designed for access to the IMM. And then, of course, you have your, <coughs> your USB ports on the back. When you do a quick breakdown and block level diagram looking at the base I.O. book, as I previously mentioned, the, uh, the processors themselves are tied to the specific uh, PCI Express slots. Uh, because of the numeric architecture and because the, um, the PCI controller now resides on the processor. So what you will see here is that processor uh, CPU 0 is going to be tied to one of the, the two uh, PCI Express slots in the I.O. book, and P uh, CPU 1 will be tied to the other uh, PCI Express slot in the I.O. book, and then, of course, CPU 0 tied to a slot uh, on the I.O. book. And then uh, CPU 1 will be tied to the other two slots on the I.O. book. Excuse me. CPU 0 is tied to two, two slots, and it's, uh, CPU 1 is going to be tied to the other two slots. So taking a look at the half-length I.O. book, it does consist of one by 16 slot and two by 8 slots. It is uh, to note uh, quickly when configuring the systems, most of the models themselves will not come standard with these two I.O. books. These will need to be added and in order to take advantage of the additional two I.O. books and CPU slot, uh, again, enumerating from zero slots um, uh, two and three, you would need to have CPU books in slots two and three in order to take advantage of the I.O. books to have these can be, the system can be configured with two of these I.O. books. Uh, these, are, again, are not going to be designed for the higher wattage GPUs. That will be in the full-length I.O. book. And how this connects in, uh, as previously mentioned, again, with the PCI controller sitting on the processor itself, each I.O. book will be tied directly to each uh, CPU book. And then, of course, uh, last but not least, we do have our full-length I.O. book. Uh, the full-length I.O. book is unique in that it will support two, uh, up to 300-watt uh, uh, GPU support. Uh, so uh, it will support, you, know, you have two aux power connectors, 425-watt or 300-watt um, connectors on, the, um, on that particular, uh, on the particular book itself to so take advantage of the higher wattage, whether it's GPUs, whether it's uh, cell fi adapters, or uh, want to take advantage of, say, some of the higher wattage uh, PCI Express SSDs. Now this, I, I want to uh, make a quick note. This is, again, a foam-length book. It will sit approximately three inches out uh, the back of the server itself. Uh, and uh, that is just a quick uh, in, uh, note on that. So it's not going to be flush like the, the half-length I.O. book. This will sit, uh, sit out just a little bit. Still within um, rack requirements in terms of depth. Uh, it just, again, it does sit out just a little bit. Now, um, I also want to note that the server will support up to two of these in, in, the, um, in, it, in a, a fully populated configuration. So you can have two full length, or you can have, if you choose to, a full length or a half length in the server itself. Now, breaking it down from a block level view of the full length, um, full length uh, I.O. book itself, again, 2 by 16 slots. You do have a Gen 2 uh, by 4 slot. Uh, so that allows you, again, you get the 32 lanes uh, going to the individual processor, plus you have the additional four lanes of Gen 2 in there that you could take advantage of an additional part. And then, of course, I, I already talked about it, but uh, you do have support up to 225 watt and 300-watt high-power adapters. Um, you do have one by four uh, power connector. Um, this power connector will support up to 150 watts of power, and then of course, uh, you know, by three cables uh, may also be plugged into that as well. And then we have a by three power connector that can support up to 75 watts. 
quick high level view of just how this would actually be configured in the system again to take advantage of the two additional IO books you would need to have CPUs 2 and 3 uh, compute books installed in the system you can leverage for two half link two full link where you can do any mixing of them both now, as previously mentioned, the 3850 is a scalable solution, uh, scalable uh, in the context of you can either purchase um, a four socket today in, or an eight socket uh, today, or you could purchase a four socket today and do a eight socket upgrade in the future. What does this consist of? As previously mentioned, this is a chassis-based architecture. In order to actually do the upgrade, this would be a field serviceable upgrade, and IBM technician would come on site and actually do the replacement. So they would replace the four socket chassis with an eight socket chassis, and they would replace the mid plane and the chassis, which the, the two unique parts here are going to be the mid plane and going to be the, the chassis. The common parts would be CPU books, IO books, power supply, storage, and of course your hard disk drive, um, hard disk drive backplace. So, to go from a four socket, as you can see, um, as highlighted with the red, four not, uh, the four socket unique parts, parts that can be reused, reused um, would be, and then of, uh, of course uh, in green, and then of course in um, in blue, your eight socket upgrade tip on the uh, right, right hand side. So in our previous generation X5, um, to do scalable solutions, you still had two servers that you were dealing with. They were cabled together, but they were still physically two independent servers. They had two serial numbers. They had two IMMs for management, so independent management and localized to each individual server. With X6, we've changed that, and so when you go to an 8U solution, it is an 8U internal midplane. It is a single eight socket chassis. Again, each component is modular, so you have your four compute modular books on the top and your four compute modular books on the bottom. But it is a serial, uh, a single serial name. Uh, so from an asset management perspective, uh, you do not have to track multiple different serial numbers in your uh, infrastructure. And then last but not least, uh, there is a single point of control with a, a single primary IMM with a secondary IMM for backup only. Uh, it is not uh, so a single management interface for controlling the entire complex. So when you take a look at what you can do with an eight socket solution, we have what's called our flex node capabilities. What this allows you to do is physically carve up the two independent servers. So if you take a look at the top solution here, you can configure the server into two physical four socket or four way clusters of servers. Now they would if they would actually be two independently powered or two independent servers themselves. Or you can do, and that's taking advantage of flex node, um, carving it up into two physical servers. Or you can repurpose that into a full scalable eight-way uh, eight -way server, or server itself. Um, this can be beneficial in an IT infrastructure in the context that you can, say for example, you may need additional compute capacity in the evenings, and you could repurpose the server as an eight-way server in the evening to take advantage of you know, all eight physical processors and enhance memory or additional memory capacity there. And then maybe at 6 a.m. you need to repurpose these servers, then you reboot the servers into two uh, you know, clusters or two physical nodes, uh, and each providing its own physical workload. So with the, uh, with the X5 product family, we introduced what we, we call our ML2 adapters. And our ML2 or MLOM2 adapters, these are our proprietary mezzanine cards that will slide onto the proprietary slot in the base I.O. book. We have multiple different vendors and options to, to, uh, to configure the servers with. Some systems will come standard with an MLOM or ML2 uh, card in the system, but do note that you want to pay, pay very close attention when you're configuring the systems to make sure that you have a slot in there. They will not have an onboard Ethernet standard in most models. So uh, with that, we have our Emulex VFA uh, adapters, which most are probably already familiar with if, you're, if you've leveraged previous generation um, X5 or even um, our high volume 1U2 base servers um, for uh, flex based systems. Our Emulex VFA is a standard option on many servers. Uh, it is a dual-core gigabit, uh, uh, 10, uh, 10 gigabit, excuse me, 
uh, adapters sitting in the M long two slot. We also offer options, uh, 10 gig options via uh, Intel. Uh, this is a uh, copper based uh, 10 gig solution. We also have a quad core gigabit E uh, solution. This, I will tell you, comes standard on several servers that I've configured recently. Server. So if you want to take advantage of the uh, a 10 gig MM option and you select the server with this adapter, you would need to pull it out. Note that it will not fit into another slot because it is proprietary. Uh, in addition to the reason why we came out to, to give you flexibility and choice in terms of configuring the system, these adapters do come at a significant cost uh, savings over to the traditional PCI Express. PCI Express version of the same adapter. So you can configure a system, say for example, with an Emulex BFA adapter uh, at a significant cost reduction over the equivalent part number for a standard PCI Express adapter. We also have a Broadcom, we also have a Broadcom adapter in our portfolio for 10 gig Ethernet. And then of course, um, you know, a, a, a copper variation of that as well. Looking at the cooling on the system, as a part of our calibrated vector cooling, we do have channel cooling throughout the system. I won't talk a lot about this slide here, but we do have fan zones, and each fan zone is controlled by fans. For example, CPUs, um, it's a fan zone two for CPU zero has two fan packs in the front, which will uh, cool that particular uh, compute book as well as the uh, the NLOM slot and PCI slot 9. And of course, then as you take a look at the additional zones themselves, uh, each zone has cooling that will cool to keep the compute book and channel back through the actual IO books on the service. And of course, each power supply has their own fan. From a power perspective, uh, we will offer uh, we offer three different uh, power supply options with 3850 at 1400 watts a 900 watt and a 700 watt DC input power uh, option on these systems. They are hot swappable, uh, supportable, uh, supporting uh, both uh, from an AC perspective, uh, low line and high line voltages. Uh, so you can take advantage of 110 or 220 volts uh, on these particular solutions. These power supplies can be mixed in the solution. I'll talk about it. They, they provide a balance of inputs and redundancy. Um, so uh, you can actually take advantage of you know two lines or two um, circuits and have sustained inputs and power failures uh, in the systems itself. They are to note when you're actually looking at uh, the, for example, logged into your uh, integrated management module or your INM, you actually look at capacity on uh, or wattage total wattage on your power supplies. It's only going to be 95% due to loss from current sharing on the system itself. So. Uh, two 1400 watt power supplies show up as 2660 uh, watts instead of 2800 watts. I know that these are 80 plus certified power supplies, so they all have the, the EPA platinum certification and 80 plus certification. Uh, so a typical configuration on a 3850 from a power um, power perspective, uh, you're going to want to balance your loads on your feeds. So you'll have two circuits, and you'll want to balance your class or your your power supplies on on those, uh, and uh, again, uh, the slide deck will be provided to you. So there's some additional information on configuring, uh, optimizing uh, the power supplies and the systems themselves. As I previously mentioned, you can intermix the power supplies. You can have two 900 watt and two 1400 watt power supplies. If you choose to do so. Proper configuration to, would be to balance those across uh, across both power feeds. And coming back to the stretch here, I'll talk a little bit about some of our IBM management tools. Uh, as many of you are probably aware of, IBM has our IBM Systems Director Management Suite. This is a uh, system level, uh, or excuse me, a um, data center level um, systems management suite designed to manage both uh, your rack tower um, and, of course, chassis-based solutions, including our X6 product family. Um, this is an, you know, a management solution that would you know, obviously manage your entire product portfolio and provides functionality and features such as uh, performance monitoring, firmware updates, alerting capabilities. Um, but again, this is, a, this is designed more for monitoring multiple systems in your infrastructure, um, and it is uh, an enterprise or a class of systems management, uh, systems management suite. Uh, the integrated management module on the systems themselves provides you enhanced capabilities monitoring at the local system for the 3850s themselves. So you get remote presence. This is standard on the 3850 platform. 
uh, the ability to uh, you know KVM remote uh, KVM or remote presence on the system or receive alerting, figuring the system, uh, figuring systems, uh, partitioning for flex node capabilities, things of that nature. And we, one item that I would like to talk about here, which is uh, you know, IBM introduced um, a little over a, a year ago, is our upper, integra upper integration modules. And we have two different integration modules. Uh, the first and foremost that I'd like to talk about is our VMware upper integration module. Now, this is a module that plugs directly into Virtual Center uh, without the, having to leverage a third-party systems management suite, such as IBM Systems Director. Most, uh, most IT administrators today are already leveraging virtual center on a daily basis. You may not touch an IBM systems director um, or a systems management application on a daily basis, whereas IT administrators stay in a virtual environment are probably touching virtual center daily and performing most of their tasks and their infrastructure via that one single pane of glass. Now we have this plugin that actually goes into virtual center that allows you the capabilities to actually monitor the system, receive hardware error, and hardware monitoring alerts um, directly into Virtual Center. So there are two different actual methods for installation. One will be a standalone method, and the other will be uh, the web client. So obviously, uh, Intel, or not, excuse me, Intel, um, VMware's direction is to start leveraging the web interface uh, for managing the virtual infrastructure. Uh, that being said, the, uh, these plugins, uh, this particular plugin, gives you all of the capabilities. So, for example, when you select a system on the left-hand side or a cluster of systems on the left-hand side, you are presented with, on the right-hand side, uh, an additional tab or resource to receive those power monitoring, the, uh, the hardware uh, error alerts, um, failure monitoring. Um, you can do uh, migration of your virtual machine. And then, of course, uh, with IMM, uh, with the IMM capabilities and actually pulling these into uh, your virtual center, uh, you have the ability to configure UEFI and um, IMM settings directly within virtual center. Uh, you can, uh, so th those are the enhanced capabilities of the upper integration module. One other item that I would like to note is that you have the capabilities of doing limited firmware updates from uh, the upper integration module for uh, virtual center. We also have an upper integration module for Microsoft uh, System Center works very similar to the VMware, uh, the, the VMware upper integration module. Again, giving you the capability to do hardware monitoring. You have limited OS, uh, OS level deployment capabilities. Uh, and then, of course, system firmware and configuration updates directly from Microsoft System Center. Um, last but not least, Electronic Service Agent, ESA, as, it, as, as it's called. On our previous generation X5, we brought the ESA directly into the integrated management module. This is the home, phone home alerting capabilities that can be set up and configured to have the system automatically contact IBM on a predictive failure alert or on a hardware failure. Uh, so this can be configured directly within the IMM. On other systems, uh, this is an agent that sits at the application layer stack that will do the phone home capabilities. So as we start to wrap up here on the, um, you know, wrapping up IBM's, uh, you know, X6 architectures here, you know, the the key things to note uh, from uh, the 3850 portfolio and the, the Flex 6 portfolio is that E7 architecture is designed for IHO hungry applications, uh, analytics, database, uh, mainframe, or extreme uptime uh, in your in your data center. You want to leverage this particular portfolio in I/O intensive, uh, mission critical applications, performance oriented applications where uptime is critical. Uh, you want to uh, you know obviously take advantage of some of the resilient features built into the X6 portfolio based off of the 20 additional RAS features that you can achieve leveraging the E7 processor. When you actually start to take a look at some of the, you know, the benefits, the key benefits of the 3850 uh, portfolio or the X6 portfolio, you you see significant performance increases up to 200%. You can see significant cost savings in software licensing, specifically when you start looking at perhaps consolidation ratios, where socket licensing is critical, uh, virtualized environments where you might have say 30 
physical dual socket E5 base host, you may be able to consolidate those down onto maybe six to eight four socket hosts. So you can actually save and uh, save significantly on software licensing. And then, of course, you see uh, storage uh, reduction um, by over to 70% as you start to take advantage of some of the unique and innovative flash technologies that we bring to the table in the X6 portfolio. Acquisition costs can be reduced over to 28 plus percent. Uh, again, when you start to take a look at hosting multiple generations of technology in a single solution, uh, leveraging the modular capabilities of the 3850, 3950 solution. And then as you look at uh, over the past uh, 10 years, uh, you start to see a significant growth uh, in um, workloads, uh, and it's growing exponentially in the data center. The X6 uh, portfolio uh, can enhance uh, your uh, your your experience with with uh, the uh, with up to three times more memory increase and up to 57 percent more I/O by taking advantage of the 3850 uh, or X6 portfolio. Again, we have unique RAS features that are mainframe inspired. Uh, of course, in a double chip grill, we talked about some of the enhanced memory functionality, single device data capture, double device data, data capture uh, at the E7 level. So in um, April of 2014, ITIC uh, introduced or, or released a study that they'd done on uh, comparing the different uh, hardware vendors or server manufacturers in the industry. And this is an independent um, consulting or independent study that was performed on uh, downtime of servers uh, of more than four hours um, on each server hardware platform in 2014. And as you can see from the bottom there, IBM is number one in the industry in terms of being able to address uh, server reliability within a four hour response time or, or keeping the downtime under four hours. And as you move up, obviously, you can see there are multiple different other hardware vendors in the marketplace. We are the market leader in this space. As a part of the X6 portfolio, IBM does have a, a series of predefined configurations that you can configure for your environment and your infrastructure. So if you want to take advantage of, say, an SAP solution, we have uh, integrated solutions that can be configured directly from IBM and their single part number and go then. We also have solutions under where VMware vCloud Suite, Microsoft, Microsoft Hyper-V, and then, of course, solutions with DB2. Again, uh, you can uh, be confident and you know have pre-architected, tested solutions directly from IBM and have them uh, presented into your infrastructure um, again, as a single partner. This is a little bit of a busy slide here. But this is a slide that I pulled together that I think you know, will summarize some of the key benefits of leveraging the E7 and the 3850 or even the, the X6 on Flex. Now, one thing to note, and I talked about it a little bit earlier, IBM is marked tier leader in four second socket in higher solutions. That's not just this in the x86 space, that's also in AIX power and mainframe. Uh, we have a uh, number one patent leadership for over 19 years, and of course we have uh, in the scalable four socket space achieved uh, you know, a, a series of number one benchmarks across suites including TPMC, VMark, and, and a series of others. One of the other unique features as I talked about earlier was the EX flash memory for virtualized workloads. Um, the, it gives you the ability to increase performance as you scale out um, in, in the actual server itself. As VM density does increase, uh, the, the demands on centralized storage uh, can be a severe bottleneck. Um, spans, spans that support virtualized infrastructures uh, can be challenged to deliver that uh, linear I.O. performance uh, because of disk latencies. Um, they'll increase over time as the number of VMs increase. By taking advantage of EX flash, uh, you get linear I.O. scaling that's independent of your uh, external storage or centralized storage solutions so you can drive extremely low latency, high IOPS, um, and of course uh, the number of VMs can de decrease, or IOPS for VMs can decrease is, is by less than 10% um, as you scale from 1 to 16 VMs per server. That's compared with an 80% re reduction uh, with SAP. So that being said, uh, the E7 product does bring an additional 20 
uh, RAS features over the, the comparable E5 based solution, hence the 99.9% the, 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 the uptime uh, for mission critical workloads. So when you're actually looking for ERT or database type workloads that need that resiliency and that main, maintain that uptime, you want to consider the E7 based processor. I talked about it just a moment ago about socket savings in terms of licensing. Uh, you can actually save uh, and achieve upwards of a 30 to 50 percent reduction in CPU count, lowering overall per socket licensing cost. In our last section here, I'll talk a little bit about um, uh, the competitive landscape. Obviously, there are other vendors in the marketplace that have E7 solutions. Uh, IBM has the 3850, 3950 solution, as well as the two. 280, 480, and x80 solutions in the marketplace. Cisco, of course, has their solutions. When you want to do a quick side-by-side -side comparison, IBM does bring a number of unique uh, technologies to the E7 um, platform that other vendors have, cannot uh, and have not implemented as of yet, including uh, if you start to take a look on the left-hand side here, our flex node capability, the ability to partition your system. That applies both in the Flex X6 as well as the 3850 platform. We have the ability to uh, take advantage of EX Clash DIMMs that is unique to IBM's um, product portfolio and other vendors in the marketplace do take, uh, do take advantage of this. One item I did not mention earlier, and I, I, uh, I want to mention it now, the I.O. books, both the half-length and the full-length I.O. books, can be hot swapped. This is a technology that we introduced several generations ago in our previous EXA architecture. Uh, it was uh, it was not present in a, in a couple of generations, but then now uh, we brought that back. What this allows you to do is a uh, a button on the on the actual I/O book itself. You would press, and as long as you have a supported operating system, power will be filled to the PCI Express slots. You can pull on that I/O book. You can pull that I/O book out and replace that I/O book. Uh, with an additional I.O. book if you choose to do so. When looking at the Flex 6 product portfolio, uh, we do scale from 2, 4, and 8 sockets. Obviously, Cisco does have a competing solution in the marketplace for E7 in their UCS solution. However, they cannot scale as high as we can. Um, we also uh, have uh, additional capabilities in terms of solid state disks and spindle disk options in our uh, uh, x80, uh, 880, uh, 480, and 280 solutions. And with that being said, uh, that wraps up our presentation today. Thank you for your time. And uh, Ben, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to talk to my way. Yeah, thank you, Sandy. That was uh, very thorough information. Um, so I think that uh, led to not a lot of questions, but we have a uh, if anybody has any questions at this point, please uh, you know type them into the questions uh, um, the tab within your webinar um, uh, sidebar. So uh, we did have a couple questions. Uh, first off, um, um, is the flash uh, storage accelerator software is it a, a feature on demand on the server rate key, or how does that apply to the system? Um, and then also second to that, uh, does it uh, so to repeat it, works on uh, utilizing local SSD, PCI flash, and SAN, and SAN uh, dash storage, or? Okay, so let me address the flash dash storage accelerator. That's going to be an application, um, and correct me if I'm wrong on that one, uh, ben, but I believe that's an application layer. So that is not going to be a feature on demand. Yep, it's going to apply to the... Uh, to uh, ESX, okay. uh, it also works with uh, Hyper-V and Correct. Um, I believe, but yeah, just those two, isn't it? Correct. And then also uh, the uh, uh, it does uh, utilize local SSD and PCI-based flash. Correct. Uh, another question. Yeah. Another question that I already uh, answered uh, for the uh, user was: uh, um, Can it? Uh, be supported, or when will it be supported on the X280, 480, and 880? And as you mentioned, it will be uh, third or fourth quarter. Correct, for EX slash guns. For the EX slash, yep. Uh, let's see here. Uh, do Does any of our competition have flash guns today? Not the EX Flash technology. We are unique in the industry with this technology. So today, no other vendors uh, can provide that technology. 
Okay. I'm um, not seeing any other questions pop up. So with that, we'll uh, go ahead and conclude the session. Uh, we will have the the, uh, the PowerPoint slide available on our wiki, as well as a recording of this session within the next uh, 24 hours. And uh, look for that uh, email follow-up as well um, with a link to the wiki. Thank you again for attending, and uh, we'll put this go ahead and this concludes our, concludes our session. Thank you for your time. Thank you.